We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hello again. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as the lead pastor and I'm excited to wrap up our I Am series today as we've the last six weeks and today's week seven looking through the seven times throughout the book of John that Jesus says something about Jesus, that Jesus claims something, that he makes a statement that, that we ought to learn something about him from. So I want to invite you uh, to go ahead and open up your copy of God's Word to John chapter 14. It's where we're going to be at this morning, John chapter 14. Uh, while you're finding that, by the way, if you don't own a copy of God's Word, we want you to have one, so just look underneath the chair in front of you, and we have a present there for you. It's a copy of God's Word. Write your name in it, take it home with you, spend some time reading it. It will change your life, all right? I want to say before we get into this message that what we're doing today is we're wrapping up this series. We're looking at another uh, of the, the seven. We're looking at the seventh time that Jesus makes one of these claims, and I want to be really clear that uh, Jesus says a lot about Jesus, and we're only looking through the book of John at the times where he makes these claims, but there's so much powerful, there's so many powerful things to learn about Jesus throughout Scripture. I want to encourage you to spend time in God's Word and continue to learn. That's what we do every time we open up God's Word here at this church. We're really learning about Jesus. We're learning about how Jesus can reveal more about the Father to us. We're learning more how we can become like the Father. Um, so ultimately today we're wrapping up this series. Uh, next week we start a brand new series called Asking for a Friend. And I want to encourage you to be here for that Sunday. My, my wife and my children and I, we leave for sabbatical. Not next, we'll be here next Sunday, uh, but really that week after that we're leaving. But we're excited. We're going to be here next week for the kickoff of that series uh, the, the person who I consider my, my mentor growing up, my youth pastor, who then became the senior pastor of, a, uh, of my church in California, will be here to kick off that series next week, so you really don't want to miss it. We're going to tackle the question, if God is good, why, do, why can he allow bad things to happen to good people? And so we're going to explore that question. That might be a question you've asked yourself in light of all the things going on in our world right now. You might think, how in the world could a good God let those things happen in this world? Make sure you don't miss it next week. All right, hopefully you're in John chapter 14. Can I just say this real quick? If you're in this room and maybe you were invited here today, maybe you just decided to walk in and sit down, but you don't really quite know yet what you believe about this book, you don't quite know what, yet what you believe about Jesus, I want you to, to, to maybe just lean in today. Uh, be, be willing to hear some, some truth from God's word. I even want to say, really, that none of us in this room are perfect. We're in this process of being perfected. It's not going to happen on this side of heaven. But we're all on this journey. We're all messed up sinners in need of salvation. And we want to invite you to join us in this journey as we work towards becoming more and more like Jesus. So if we want to become more like Jesus, we want to look at Jesus and see who Jesus says that he is so we can become more like him. Let's pray. God, I ask right now that you would show us more about who you are. Allow us to see truths about who you are by the claims of your son. God, we ask that you would bless this teaching. Speak through me. Allow me to speak and communicate clearly what it is that each of us needs to be able to see this morning. God, reveal truth to us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so a little bit of context before you get into John 14, verse 6, where we're going to end up. We're going to start at John 14 at the beginning of the chapter. And essentially, uh, and again, the context is Jesus is in the upper room, and he's with his closest disciples. 
right? Jesus is in the upper room. He's with his disciples. He makes his claim, not in a public setting, but he makes his claim to a specific group of people in the upper room. This is right during the time, right, of the Last Supper. He's washing the disciples' feet. All that stuff's going on, and he's, he's about to make some powerful claim. John 14, 1, that's the context. He says this. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. So what makes him make this statement? You see, Jesus already knows that in, you know, throughout uh, John and specifically throughout the last few chapters, Jesus has made a lot of claims about change coming. He's made claims that he's going to leave. He's made claims that someone's going to betray him. He's made claims about all sorts. And all the disciples are sitting there. And Jesus is able to notice in an instant that they are anxious. How many of you enjoy change? You like when things are different than they were yesterday. Some of us are weird. I kind of enjoy change every once in a while, the right kind of change, you know, moving a couch from one side of the room to the other. That kind of change is kind of fun sometimes. But for the most part... As part of the human experience, we don't like change. We avoid it at all costs. And the disciples are sitting there with Jesus, and Jesus has been making all these claims about change coming. And he knows that his disciples have anxious hearts. So he says this phrase. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. This actual word that's used in in the Greek is this word tarasso. When this word trouble, don't let your hearts be troubled. It's, It's really the word that means stirred or agitated. Don't let your hearts be in like a whirlwind. Don't let your hearts get all kind of like, like stirred up and, and get get all, you know, white water and all don't don't get all agitated. You see, Jesus knows that they're starting to suffer from this separation anxiety. I have three daughters in my house and uh, a female dog as well. And my wife is a a woman. Uh, And uh, so I'm surrounded by women all in my house. All right. And that means I don't have any, any males other than me in the house. And that means there's a lot of emotions going on in my house oftentimes. And and one of those moments happened recently. I'm not going to tell you which of my children, but they are worried about some upcoming changes. There's friends that they have that are moving away. There's other friends that they have that are also moving away. There's, the, the, there's on the horizon a, no, a, a, a kind of a foreknowledge that they have some other close friends that within the next year are going to be moving away. And there's a lot of emotions. I remember walking into one of my daughter's bedrooms at nighttime. She was in tears. I'm like, what's going on? Why are you in here crying? She said, just, my friends are moving away. We don't like it when that kind of change happens, do we? And Jesus is essentially saying, all throughout chapter 13, he says, listen, I'm going to be leaving. And his disciples, their their hearts are agitated, their hearts are anxious. And Jesus then says this, don't let your hearts be stirred. Don't let your hearts be troubled. What he's really saying here is, I need you to switch from fear to faith. Listen, guys, I need you to not be ruled by your emotions right now, is what he's saying. I need you to be ruled by your faith in this moment. And then he goes on in verse 2 through 4. All right, we're setting up this statement. He says, there is more than enough room in my father's home. And if this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. So he makes this this kind of odd statement. He says, listen, I'm going away, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And there's plenty of room for you there. If there wasn't, I wouldn't tell you I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he makes this claim. And he says, when when your place is ready, when it's ready for you, I'm going to come get you and you'll be together with me. Jesus essentially says, I'm going to prepare a place for your arrival. Now, I want you to understand this statement isn't a uh, a really a doctrinal, a theological statement about heaven. It's not a, a statement about rooms or mansions or the luxuriousness of heaven. What Jesus is really saying here is essentially this, heaven is where I am. I'm going, 
And I'm going to make sure that when the timing is right, you and I get to be together again. There's plenty of room for you. But they, remember, he ended that, this statement where he says, you know the way to where I'm going. The disciples are confused because they're thinking, we don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. And so you see this. It says the disciples, are in, in verse 5, it says, no, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Can I just say that I love me some Thomas? You know, Thomas gets a bad rap in Scripture, doesn't he? We have a name within church circles that we often call Thomas. He has a nickname. Does anybody know what it is? Doubting Thomas. You know what Thomas really is? He's just vulnerable Thomas. Thomas is just willing to say what everyone else is thinking but afraid to say. Other people have doubts. Other people were worried. Other people, like in Thomas right now, other people are thinking, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. And Thomas is the one who's saying, listen, I'm just going to say, I'm not going to pretend I'm asking for a friend here, right? I'm just going to tell you, we don't know where you're going. And Thomas is vulnerable enough to say it. And then Jesus answers Thomas's question with this statement, which is the I am statement we're looking at today. In verse 6, Jesus says this. Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Will you guys all read that verse with me out loud? Let's go. It says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. It's important to understand that all three of these claims, Jesus claims to be the way, he claims to be the truth, and he claims to be the life. All three of these things would have been very significant to a Jewish person in Jesus' day. In fact, I, I noticed something this morning that I hadn't noticed when I was preparing, and I'm really excited. I included the right elements in my slides, so you get to actually see it, but I get to share an extra little tidbit of information with you. You know, in Matthew and Mark, remember there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four Gospels. These are kind of the four uh, retellings of the story of Jesus from different perspectives. Well, in Matthew and Mark, when they tell the story of the disciples being in the upper room, when they tell the story of Jesus uh, giving out the, the Last Supper and washing the disciples' feet and their time together, the time period that we're talking about right here where Jesus says this statement, Matthew and Mark add a really cool verse in your, in your Bibles where they say, after communion, it says, then they sang a hymn together. You know what's really cool about that, that sentence, that they sang a hymn together? Wouldn't it be cool to know what song they sang together? Well, if you go over to John 14, where we're at right now, where Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. In light of that, I think I can actually probably guess what song they sang together. In fact, in your Bible, you might not know this, but when you open up to the book of Psalms, Psalms is just another word for songs. These are songs that the Jewish people would have known. They would have sang these songs, just like when we gather for worship, we sing songs. Many of you have been in church for a while. You don't really need the lyrics up there because you already know the lyrics in here. You can sing those worship songs along with our, our team leading us. Well, the same would have been true here, and if I had to guess what song they sang together, I would guess that they sang Psalm 25, because let me share with you a verse that's in Psalm 25. It says, verses 4 and 5, it says, show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. In other words, God, show me the way right? And then it says, lead me by your truth and teach me. In other words, there's the truth. Show me your truth. And then here's another line of the song, for you are the God who saves me all day long. I will put my hope in you. In other words, God, you are the one who protects my life. 
So they're in the upper room, and they're singing a song. We don't really know what song, but we're, I think probably Psalm 25. And they're singing song, uh, this song that goes along the lines of, God, will you please show me your way, and will you please show me your truth, and would you please protect and save my life? And then we, we don't know about the singing of a song in John, but John skips to this conversation where Jesus says, <laughs> probably like this, hey, you know the song we just sang? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. That song we are just singing, believe it or not, it's, it's about me. And he sings this song. You see, the way, the truth, and the life are mentioned all throughout the Old Testament. These words are, are common. These are important concepts within the Jewish tradition. And they, all throughout Psalm 25, you see this pattern of way, truth, and life. And that's why I believe when you go back to John 14, 6, and Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. This is the context in which Jesus makes this claim. So let me point out something. When Jesus makes this claim that he is the way, the truth, and the life, have you noticed oftentimes the, the second part of this, right, is I am the way, the truth, and life. No one can come to the Father. So the way, we all understand that when Jesus says that he is the way, what is he really saying? He says, I am the way to the Father. We understand that those words connect. But the truth is, there's also a connection by the truth and the life. And we're going to get to each of those. So let me show you how each of these words connect back to the Father. The first one is the way to the Father. The way to the Father. You see, when you Think about a, 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 a way. Why, a, a way is, a, is like a path or a road, right? It's not an, an end in itself. It is a pathway to something else, right? You, when you are on the road, you haven't arrived at your destination. You're on the road to get to your destination. What Jesus says is he is the pathway. He is the, the road the, the, that you have to, to, to follow in order to get to your destination, which is the Father. If you want to get connected back to the Father, you've got to go on this path, is what Jesus is saying here. I don't know about you, but here's one reason why I love what Jesus is saying here. I'm really, really terrible with directions. I, I joked for about the first year here I used GPS to get to work. I, mean, I, mean, I didn't really. I've, after about four times, I figured out my way how to get here, right, from my home. But anyone else just really bad with directions? You have no idea what direction you're facing. If somebody says a road, you're like, I don't know where that is. I'm just really, really bad. And I'm so bad that if I pull up somewhere and I need help getting to a grocery store and someone says, yes, you just want to go up here and you want to turn left and you want to turn and you go up two stop signs and you turn left and you turn right. And if somebody gives directions to me like that, I already know I'm going to get lost. I'm going to get lost. But what Jesus doesn't do here, he doesn't say, I'm going to give you directions to the Father. He says, follow me, I will take you there. It would be so much better, right, if I pull up in the car and there's someone, hey, I'm trying to find this, this grocery store, do you know where the Safeway is? Yeah, let me hop in my car, just follow me. I'll take you right to Safeway. And that's what God is doing here through Jesus. Jesus is saying, I am the way, follow me. I am the path, follow me. He says, I'll take you there. You know, one really interesting thing about this concept of the way is when you look through the book of Acts, which is the early account of the church, do you know that before Christians were called Christians, they were called something else? Throughout the the book of Acts, at the the very beginning part, at least of the book of Acts, people, before they were called Christians, they were called the people of the way. Aren't you glad that changed? It's a little weird, right? It sounds like a cult. The people of the way. And that's what Christians were called early on in the book of Acts, the people of the way. And essentially, it comes back to understanding that Jesus is this way, the people of the way, people of Jesus. And eventually, our our name got changed in the book of Acts to Christians. 
And you look through the book uh, uh, and other accounts of Jesus. Jesus says things like narrow is the way. And you have now Thomas asking questions like how can we know the way? This concept of the way is mentioned all throughout Scripture. And Jesus then makes this claim, I am the way to the Father. Another thing that he claims is he claims to be the truth about the Father. All, right, all these point back to the Father. Not only is he the way to the Father, he also says, I am the truth about the Father. In other words, Jesus is essentially the answer to the question, what is God like? If you were to say to Jesus, what is God like? He would be able to say, I am the truth about the Father. In fact, Scripture says, if you've seen me and you know me, you know the Father. I am the truth about the Father. You can see the Father through me and through my life. There's a sociologist named Emile Durkheim, and uh, a sociology is really just the study of um, societies and how people work together and interact with each other. And this sociologist named Emile Durkheim, he looked at how different societies throughout the world, how uh, many different societies throughout the world all had some understanding of like a higher power. They all had some understanding of God. They all had some way that that they understood God to, to function and interact with them. And so in this studying of the different societies and how they had a different view of what God was like, what often people would do, if they didn't really have anyone who was revealing about the one true God, they would take, they would find some sort of a, a oftentimes a thing or an animal that had a lot of those similar characteristics of what they thought God was like. So they thought God was really, you know, strong and powerful and, and whatever. They might pick an animal that was really strong and powerful to be kind of the symbol of, of the God that they were trying to find. Or maybe they, they saw, they, maybe they, they, the sun and sunlight was really important to them as farmers. So they saw the sun as something that was really, and, and they would worship the sun. And essentially found this pattern that people would find an animal or a thing or a concept that reminded, that was important to them. To create, and oftentimes they would create these things called totems. You've probably heard of a totem pole, right? You'd, the, the actual totem is just a, a creature or a, a likeness of a, the sun or a likeness of an animal that was essentially a representation of one of the attributes that these people had for what God must be like. And they would stack these things on top of each other and call them totem poles. So he's, he's Eric, Emil Durkheim, he's exploring this. And one of the things that you, he basically realized is people were taking the concepts that they had for God and essentially figuring out what was most important to them. And what they were really doing was setting up a God for themselves to worship that was kind of like a perfected version of themselves. What we do when, when left to our own, uh, to figure out our own truth, when we're trying to figure out what God is like, and we don't have anyone who's showing us what God is like, we'll come up with and create something that looks an awful lot like ourselves. And we end up worshiping ourselves without even realizing it. And so it took this sociologist, what was it, uh, um, uh, 450 pages to describe this. But Paul, I love this, Paul writes about it in just five verses in the book of Romans. Here's what he says. It says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise, amen. Essentially, Paul is able to write this whole concept, what Emil took 450 pages to write. Paul says in five verses, people traded the truth about the creator and started worshiping things that were created by the creator. 
And essentially, we find ways when we don't have the truth to fall for a lie and worship things that aren't true. George Bernard Shaw, I love this quote. I'm not going to put it on the screen, but here's what one of the quotes that he's, he's uh, claimed to have said is, God created man in his own image, and man, being a gentleman, returned the favor. Essentially what he's saying is, God created us in his, in his image, and what we've done to return the favor is we've decided to create a God in our image. And what Jesus then claims, right, when he's got his disciples together and he knows that our hearts are, are wicked and that we, we will constantly try to create something that we can worship that looks a whole lot like ourselves because we think we're pretty awesome, Jesus says, listen, if you really want to know how you should worship and who you should worship and what God is like, I am the truth about the Father. You don't need to create some totem. You don't need to create some image. You don't need to create some idol and give your worship to something that the creator created. Instead, you can worship the creator himself. Jesus says, I am the truth. There's a, a little boy, and he was drawing a picture in Sunday school class. And the teacher came up and said, what are you drawing? And the boy said, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. The teacher said, well, how can you draw a picture of God? Nobody knows what God looks like. And the boy said, come back in five minutes, you will. Right? I mean, we, we often think that we can figure out and know what God is like on our own. And essentially what happens when we create God on our own, and when we use the, the lies of this world to create a picture of what God is like, we're creating a lie. And Jesus says, I am the truth about who the Father is. And here's the last one. Not only am I the way, not only am I the truth, but I am the life of the Father. I am the life of the Father. In John 10.10, 10, this is what Jesus says. Jesus says the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. What he's really claiming here is my intention is to give you access to the life that only the Father can provide through me. I have an abundant life planned for you. I have a purpose and something good planned for your life. And the way you access it, the life of the Father, is through Jesus. He's not just saying here and now. It sounds like when he's talking to his disciples, he's saying, listen, I am the life, you know, for, from now until you die, you can have life through me. He's not just claiming to give an abundant life to those of us who are followers of Christ now. He's claiming to give you access to the life of the Father, not only now, but for all eternity. We have access to the life of the Father. In fact, in John 14, Verse 19, if we were to keep reading forward, this is what Jesus says. Since I live, you also will live. You see, because Jesus was resurrected from the dead, each one of us has access to that same resurrection from the dead. Each one of us has access to eternal life through Jesus who makes this powerful claim. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So let's look at that, that verse again. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Can I just point out something that I haven't pointed out yet about this verse? There's three really small words that keep getting repeated in this verse that bug a lot of people. And it's the word, the. Jesus doesn't say, I am a way, I am a truth, and I am a life. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There's something really powerful about that kind of a claim. It's very exclusive, isn't it? There's this concept that, that some people kind of understand, this, this concept called like pantheism, where essentially there's this, this idea that there's many different ways 
to get to the Father. There's many different ways to get to God. There's many different ways to get to heaven. You can follow your path. If you're a Christian, that's great. You follow that path up the mountain. And I'm going to be over here on this side of the mountain, and I'm, going to, I'm a Muslim, and I'm going to follow this path. And I'm over here, and I'm a Buddhist, and I'm going to follow this path. And I'm over here, and you have all these different paths that all lead, uh, essentially to, in this concept, that they all lead, it's this concept, right, that all roads lead to Rome. But then Jesus makes a claim like this, and he doesn't say, I'm one of the ways up the mountain to meet the Father. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. In John 4, verses 23 and 24, it says, but the time is coming, indeed it is here now, when true worshipers, which means what? There are going to be false worshipers. will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, the only way to properly worship God is to recognize that his Son is the one and only way the one and only truth, and the one and only life. The only access you have to the Father is through Jesus Christ. I did a little bit of research. You can go to India, and Buddha's cremated body, his ashes have been placed in different monuments throughout India. Joseph Smith's body is buried in Nauvoo, Illinois, Confucius is buried in the Sandog province of China. Muhammad is buried in Medina, Saudi Arabia. I could go on, but for the sake of time, can I just tell you that the tomb of Jesus is empty? We worship in our faith system a Jesus who conquered death, a Jesus who who, who created a pathway for us to be able to conquer death, a pathway for us to be reconnected to the Father. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we're not worshiping a God or a Jesus who said that and is still dead, buried in the ground somewhere, where we're worshiping a resurrected Savior. And so this claim, it, it seems awfully exclusive. Let me just say this, the gospel as exclusive in its message, but it is inclusive in its reach. In other words, the gospel message is for everybody. There is no one who is too far gone for Jesus to make a powerful, saving, eternity-changing change in your life. There's only one way about it, and it's through Jesus. But the message is inclusive in its reach. If you add anything to the gospel, by the way, it no longer becomes the gospel. The gospel is the gospel. When you start adding other things to it, when you start changing it to make it more as, uh, palatable, when you start adding other words to it, whatever words that might be, you know, one of the, the new ones is kind of the, the social gospel. When you start adding other things to the gospel, it stops being the gospel. And what Jesus is saying is there's only one way, there's only one truth, and there's only one life, and that is me. So let me share with you briefly to wrap up four things I want everyone to know about the gospel. And if you're taking notes, you don't have to write anything else down. I put these on the bottom of your note sheet. But I want to make sure everybody in this room has an opportunity to hear these truths. First of all, before we even get to the first truth, I want you to know that there's a God who loves you, and he loves you so much that because you're imperfect and imperfect people aren't allowed in the presence of a perfect God, he wanted to restore that relationship with you. And the only way to do that was by sending his son to be the way, the truth, and the life for you. And that through putting your faith in Jesus, you have access, renewed access to righteousness. You have renewed access to being right before the Father. So here's the first thing I would want you to know about the gospel. One 
is that God wants everyone to be saved. The Bible is really clear about this in John 3.16. This is a verse that you probably already know. It says, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say that God loved a portion of the world or God loved certain people in the world. It said, for God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, into the world so you might have access back to the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that anyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I like to say that God is a hopeful universalist. Before you quote me on that, really think about what I just said. God longs for everyone to be able to live with him for eternity. But that leads to the second thing, is God is actively pursuing everybody so that this can become a reality. God is actively pursuing you right now. You might not be a follower of Jesus. You might not believe what this book says, but I want you to know that God is actively pursuing you, is actively searching out and, and, and longing for a relationship with you, is actively, actively doing a work in your life and in your heart. You might reject that, but I want you to know that God is actively pursuing everybody. He's revealing himself through creation. He's revealing himself through his word. He reveals himself through miracles. There's all sorts of ways God reveals himself to you. I just want you to know he's actively pursuing you. A third thing I would want you to know is that everyone will have an opportunity to freely choose to receive or reject salvation through Jesus. Every single person in this room, you're being actively pursued. You get to freely decide whether or not you're going to accept or reject a relationship with the way the truth and the life, and whether or not you want Jesus to be the way back to the Father for you, the truth about the Father for you, and the life of the Father for you. You get to decide. One of the reasons why this is such a powerful thing is if God programmed you and made it so that you had to love him, that wouldn't be love, right? If I created a, a computer program and a little robot doll that just said, I love you to me over and over again, you guys wouldn't be convinced. That wouldn't be love because I programmed it to tell me that it loves me. And if God programmed you to love him, that wouldn't be love. He created you with a free will to decide whether or not you choose to love him. That's the reason he put the tree in the garden. You get to decide. Do you want to do things my way or do you want to do things your way? You get to freely decide whether or not you want to love me. Everyone will have an opportunity to freely choose to receive or reject salvation through Jesus. And number four, don't miss this one. God will judge each person based on their response. One day you will stand before the Father and you will either be able to display the resume of Jesus Christ and say, hey, Jesus took all my sin and while he was hanging on the cross, he took all the crap I've done, all the bad things I've done, everything that is bad about me, he took it all and he paid for it on the cross. And now, when I'm standing before the Father, Jesus is going to see the righteousness of his son. When I'm judged before the Father, I believe with all my heart because I've made a decision to let Jesus pay for my sin on the cross. God is going to see the righteousness of his son in me. But other people, I don't know why you would want to do this. Other people decide, one day I want to stand before God, and instead of showing the resume and the blank slate of Jesus, I want to stand on my own two feet and say, here's all the things I've done. Judge me. The Bible's really clear that God is light, and in him there is no darkness. And if you stand before God as an imperfect sinner who hasn't been saved through faith in Jesus, that you will have to be punished through a real, by, by spending eternity in a real place called hell. And yet Jesus, remember, he came that you might have life, not only here, but in eternity. He came that you might have life and that you might have it for the full, to the full. God will judge each person based on their response. So what now? I wanna ask, as we ask this question, what now, God? I wanna ask you, if you're in this room right now, whether you're a follower of Christ already and have been struggling, or maybe you're not yet a follower of Christ, the one thing I would want you to do before you leave here today 
is trust that Jesus is who Jesus claims to be. Maybe that's about the bread of life. Maybe that's when he said he was the resurrection. Maybe that's when he said he was the gate. Maybe it's when Jesus reminded you that he is a good shepherd for you. Whatever it was that Jesus is claiming about himself throughout this series, I wanna ask you, follower of Christ, to trust that Jesus is who Jesus claims to be. Lean into that. But for those of you in this room who are not yet followers of Christ, the one thing I would love for you to trust in today is say, I wanna trust today for the first time that Jesus is the way that Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the life and that nobody can be connected back to the Father except through Jesus. And if you can say today that you'd wanna make that decision for the first time, I'm gonna be standing up here. I'd I'd welcome any of our staff or overseers, our prayer team, uh, they'll be standing up here as well while we sing these last couple of songs. If you wanna make a decision to trust Jesus today, maybe you just wanna come forward for prayer, you can do that. Let's pray together. Father, I I lift up right now the the individual or individuals in this room that have not yet made a decision to trust you as the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray that today would be the day that that changes, that today would be the day that they put their faith and trust in the good news of the gospel, that they decide, I don't want to stand on my own two feet. I want to stand uh, with with the the, the resume and of Jesus. I want to one day stand before God and know that Jesus has paid the price for my sin. That today would be the day that they make that call and start that walk and that relationship with you. Now we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.